In the last video, we looked at traditional architectures for speech recognition, where you break up the problem into smaller pieces. Here, we'll look at sequence to sequence speech recognition, trying to use some of the more modern neural network and deep learning architectures that we have. And interestingly, the main question that we need to ask is who in all these systems knows English or knows the language that we're trying to decipher. In the traditional architecture, we had a component that this uh, that analyzed the signal, and then we had these two components, the acoustic model and the language model. The acoustic model knew the phones because it could transform the spectrogram into phones of the language. And by the way, if what we detected were phones, there was also a lexicon that could put together the phones and turn them into a word of the language. So all of these are contained in the acoustic model. Then we also have the language model, which is a rudimentary form of the grammar of the language. It certainly knows what are the possible sequences of words in English, for example. So it is clear that these two elements have some knowledge of the target language and that we combine that knowledge to then produce a prediction. However, if we just go from signal to transcription, which part of our uh, deep learning system is going to know the language? Which, one's part, which one is going to know English? There's two answers to that question, and those are the main types of sequence-to-sequence -sequence speech recognition systems. We could use connectionist temporal classification, which basically maps a string of uh, phone outputs and assigns them a probability of being a certain orthographic word. So these probabilities are, in essence, a language model of English. We could also use encoder decoders, like the ones we've studied in week six, where, for example, you take a spectrogram, turn it into a temporary transcription of the phones of the language, and then you run that through an encoder so that it can decode the orthographically correct form of the language. And by the way, it does so by paying, also does so by paying attention to context. And that's how it could handle long distance dependencies, for example. Let's take a brief look at the connectionist temporal classification approach. So let's say you have an audio signal and some of your windows, you have the fricative for which then turns into the vowel and so forth. So you're going to have a string of potential phones, potentially a very large string because these windows are very small. You need to map the probability that these strings, which might contain errors in detection or might have some variation, you need to map the probability that those strings are a certain word of English. That, for example, this is hello and not hilo, for example. So they have um, layers or some system that can measure these probabilities. And this would be the part of the system that knows a little bit of English. A second approach would be to use encoder decoders. This is an example architecture which takes, which encodes the audio features, pays attention to the words that it has predicted before, and also uses a decoder for the words it has predicted before. And it uses all of these inputs to then provide a candidate for the orthographic symbol that I should be seeing at that moment of the spectrographic signal. So you take the spectrographic signal, attention to the words before, and you decode the words before to try to predict what orthographic symbol should come next. This is an example of such an architecture. Again, uh, you take a spectrogram and you produce some sort of uh, intermediate phone representation of the string. And then you pass that through an encoder, which then decodes it as the orthographic version of what you're trying to transcribe. These systems can incorporate attention, like we studied on week six. Uh, this is an example of a system. And by the way, graduate students, I'm leaving you the links to all the research papers that have these contents, 
uh, there below. You can get them from the PDF. So this is an example of attention to a spectrographic signal with the phrase, how much would a woodchuck chuck? As you can see here, for example, when you are trying to predict the H in how, this is a hypothesis that the system generates. And when it's generating that hypothesis, it pays attention to parts of the signal. Uh, here, it's paying a lot of attention to the vowel and also attention to what comes before it. So this is the way your mouth is going to open. Um, this is possibly the start of the friction of the fricative H and also the influence of the vowel O on the fricative H because of corticulation. So when it generates this hypothesis for a character, it's paying attention to several windows at the same time. And you can see how it does that throughout the processing of the signal. For example, for the spaces, it pays attention to more to two windows at the same time to try to figure out what would be the potential break in between words. And this has proved a very successful approach for speech recognition. But it does have one key weakness. It needs a lot of data in the order of thousands of hours. You need a minimum of hundreds of hours to make the system work with accuracies of uh, below 10 percent of word error rate, for example. I just want to mention very briefly that we have been looking at speech to text, so speech transcription. We can also do this the other way around, and then we would have text to speech. This is uh, an example of a state-of-the-art system called Tacotron 2, which is, as you can see, a mesh of ConfNets and LSTM neural networks that go from a, an orthographic string to a graphic spectrogram, which is then sampled into a waveform, into a sound signal. So this is one way that you could produce the text-to-speech from a computer, for example, so that the computer can, can answer to your commands. Very interestingly, this is also something that you can use to produce deep fakes. If you train the spectrogram on the voice of just one person, then the system can uh, produce the output just for the voice of that person. So you can write whatever you want and make the system talk as if it was that person. That is one way to produce deep fakes. There is a second and very interesting way to do this. This first way, in this first way, we go from written text to voice. In the second example, we'll go from the voice of one person to the voice of a second person. And give me just a moment. You see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. Indeed, and so forth. You can watch the rest of the video below. We're in, in summary, how do these systems work? They work with an architecture of neural network called generative adversarial networks. These networks take an input, for example, a photograph, and then are trained to produce a certain type of output. For example, the same graphic, but as if it was painted by Monet, or painted by Van Gogh, or painted in the ukiyo-e Japanese style. The way they do it is that they have like a two-pronged approach to, to the training. You take the actual um, images of Monet that you have, for example, and then you uh, get other input and try to generate a fake. The first fakes, of course, are going to be terrible because they're going to be random fakes. You pass your fake and your real Monet to a discriminator that tells you how wrong you were. Like, this is a terrible fake, and it's also going to give you a distance measure between the real Monet and your generated fake Monet. By doing this, you train and retrain and retrain the generator until it's very difficult for the discriminator to tell which one's the real one and which one is the generated fake. 
we're going to use the exact same strategy with sound, where you have sound bites of Obama, for example, and then someone else's voice randomly transformed and then trained to be less and less random until the discriminator cannot tell the real Obama from the fake. And so you can transform uh, one voice into another. In summary, there are two main types of sequence-to-sequence -sequence speech recognition. Some uh, systems use CTC to calculate the probability that a certain string of fonts corresponds to a certain orthographic word. There are other systems that use encoder-decoder systems, including paying attention to context. So as you can see in the CTC approaches, these probabilities are the language model of English. In encoder-decoder, the intermediate forms and how they are decoded are the knowledge of English. Sequence-to-sequence -sequence models need a lot of data, and it is possible for them to be worse than traditional models if you don't have sufficient data. A traditional model is going to need five to ten hours of, of audio to start recognizing speech, whereas with a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, it's going to need hundreds, uh, from what I've seen, at least 300 hours for it to start working. Um, Text-to-speech systems also use sequence-to-sequence -sequence architectures, as we've seen, including systems that uh, produce deep fakes. Some of them use sequence to sequence, and some of them use other architectures called adversarial or generative adversarial networks. In the next video, we're going to look at the opposite of sequence to sequence. We're going to look at low resource speech recognition.